Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell notification button below so that you never miss new videos and tutorials on topics that you might be interested in. My name is Sava and today we are continuing our discussion of calendar anomalies on stock markets, the notable stock return patterns that are unexplainable within the efficient market hypothesis framework and that have been identified massively in the 1970s and 1980s. In one of the previous videos on the topic, we have already investigated the so-called weekend effect. That is, do stocks really underperform on Mondays and outperform on Fridays? And we have figured out that, well, this effect might have been present in the 70s, but it has since pretty much disappeared, at least on the US stock market. One of the other famous and prominent calendar anomalies identified in the 1980s, to be precise in the 1985 by Ariel, is the so-called holiday effect. Ariel has documented that the US stock market performs remarkably well in the trading days that precede public holidays, when the stock market closes and everyone is just about to enjoy themselves in the festive period. So he basically documented that the stock returns are much higher in those trading days that precede the closures for public holidays. Let's investigate whether this effect still persists in the present day. So we've got five years worth of data for the S&P 500 daily return and let's investigate the trading days before the market closes for the holiday. How one might do that? Well, the hard way and the most obvious way would be to identify public holiday dates in the US, for example, Christmas, New Year, Independence Day, Good Friday, Memorial Day, and so on and so forth, and just manually code those dates into our data set. But the easier way to do that is relatively neat. We all know that in a regular trading day, there are two holidays, Saturday and Sunday, that is. And uh, if the market closes for more than two days, maybe three days or four days, or just for one day, it then means that the reason for this closure is not the weekend, but a public holiday. Using this logic, we might be able to identify holiday stock market closures without even knowing what those holidays are. To do that, we need to figure out the day difference between the trading day and the following trading day. We can do that as Excel famously treats dates as just numbers. So we can just subtract the current date, the date of the current trading day, from the date of the following trading day. And here we get, for example, three. It means that the 2nd of January 2015 has been a Friday and um, the 5th of January 2015 is a Monday. And uh, it's unsurprising that the day difference is three. It means that the stock market was closed for the two weekends and the gap between those trading days is three days. If the gap would be less, that is, for example, two days, we would conclude that there has been one public holiday that separated the trading periods. If the day difference would have been one, that means that there were no breaks at all between the two consecutive trading days. It means there were no holidays or no weekends at all. And if the day difference would have been four or larger, it means that the public holidays coincided with the weekends, so they were carried forward onto the next working day, and it resulted in this long break in trading activity. So if we bottom right click this formula all the way down, we see that actually the formula behaves just as we would have expected. We have gaps of three between Fridays and following Mondays. We have gaps of one for just consecutive usual trading days within a week. And we have gaps of four 
between the long weekends, so trading days separated by long weekend periods. And uh, if we examine this data set for long enough, we'll see that those holidays sometimes are present, but they're not that frequent. And now we need to code um, a dummy variable, pretty much, that would be equal to one if there was a holiday, if this particular trading day is indeed preceding a public holiday, and zero otherwise. How one might code that? Well, if the day difference is equal to two, it means that there has been just one public holiday separating trading activity. So it means that there has been a holiday. And if it's not two, we need the day difference to be equal to four or more. So this day difference should be higher than three. So then if the day difference is greater than three, we identify that there has been a holiday after this trading day and zero otherwise. And this formula will give us the identification of public holidays during this trading period. The only caveat that we need to account for is the last trading day of our period, which is the 31st of December 2019. We all know that it's the final trading day of the year, and it is followed by the New Year period when trading activity stops due to the holiday period. So we can manually just code it and put one over here. And it basically gives us the whole picture when uh, the market stops for holidays, when it doesn't, and now we can examine whether the returns on the trading days preceding public holidays are indeed different from returns on other days. The conclusions of Ariel 1985 has been that the return on these days should be higher. And now we can basically check whether it's still true in 2015-2019. First of all, let's calculate the average returns on days preceding holidays and in all other days. To do that, we just need to code the average if function. If there is a holiday, this dummy variable would be equal to one. And we need to input the average range that would be just the range of returns in our sample period. And we see that the average daily return on the days preceding public holidays is roughly zero. And now we can copy this formula, paste it into another cell, and here we just need to change this one into a zero to figure out the average return on the normal trading day that is not associated with holidays or anything like that. And we see that the average daily return on non-holiday days is quite larger, 0.04%. We can already see that the notion that the returns on the days preceding public holidays is higher is blatantly false. But is the difference significant? Maybe now the effect has reversed. Maybe now the returns on uh, days preceding public holidays are significantly lower than otherwise. To test that, we need to apply a relevant t-test. To do that, we first of all need to check which of the two t-tests to apply whether we should apply the equal variance or the unequal variance t-test. Uh, for a detailed examination of this hypothesis testing, please check the Monday and Friday effect video. But as for now, we need to just calculate the variances of returns in those two groups of trading days. First of all, we apply the sample variance function, var.s, and uh, we need to input the variance for days preceding public holidays. So if the holiday dummy is equal to one, we take the array of returns. And if not, we don't do anything at all. So we can just close the brackets and close the brackets again and enforce this formula using shift control enter. And we see that the variance on the holiday dates is correctly calculated. Now we can copy this formula post it over here, and just as with the average return, substitute zero here instead of one, and then press shift Control enter again to calculate the variance on other trading days that do not precede public holidays. Now we need to figure out the sample size, the number of days in each of those two groups. So here we can just apply the count if function. We need to count all the ones in this array, and we have 
46 trading days that do precede public holidays. It means that on average there are around nine public holidays a year for the US, which is reasonably accurate. And to count all of the trading days that do not precede a holiday, we again just have to put zero instead of one over here, and we get 1212. Now, to figure out which of the t-tests to use, the equal variance one or the unequal variance one, we need to figure out the f-stat for the equality of variances to apply the respective f-test. To do that, we need to divide the maximum variance of those two onto the minimum variance of those two. And here we get 1.27, roughly. To convert this f-stat into a p-value, we need to use the right-tailed f distribution, and we need to input our f stat as the x value. We need to input um, n minus 1 as the first degree of freedom, and uh, n 2 minus 1 as the second degree of freedom. And then, as this uh, formula gives us 50% for the value of 1, we need to multiply it by 2 to correctly adjust for the fact that all of our possible F stats are one or greater because we divide the maximum variance by the minimum variance. We can in no way possible reach a value of an F stat that's less than one. And here we get 22.4% as our p-value, which is not low enough to conclude that those two variances are unequal. So we can stick with the equal variance t-test for a change and uh, that allows us to examine how to precisely apply that. First of all, here is the formula for the t-stat of the equal variance t-test. For the detailed examination of the unequal variance t-test, again, please check the uh, weekend effect video. So we need to input the difference between average returns in the numerator and calculate the estimator of the variance in the denominator. So let's start with the is a bit, calculate the difference between the returns in trading days preceding holidays and in all other trading days, and we get a negative number, which is unsurprising as this return is higher than that. And as our estimator of the standard deviation of this difference, we need to input this formula that is translated into the language of Excel. So first of all, we need to input the square root, then we need a ratio where in the numerator we would have the variance of um, returns on the holiday trading days times n1 minus 1, so 46 minus 1, plus the second variance on all other days times the number of such days minus 1, and that's our numerator. And in the denominator we have the degrees of freedom adjusted number of observations, that is n1 plus n2 minus 2. And that's our first square root done. Then we need to adjust by the number of observations. Here in this square root, we have just actually weighted our variances by the respective numbers of observations. If we can see, it's just the weighted average of the variance, basically. So then we need to adjust by the number of observations by multiplying it by the square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. If we had a one sample t-test, we would have just multiplied by the square root of one divided by n, effectively. And here, as we have two samples, albeit the variance is approximately equal in terms of statistical significance, we have to input such a sum under our square root. And that's all for the standard deviation of our t-test, and we get approximately 0.12%. Now we can figure out our t-stat, which is just the which is just the difference divided by the respective standard deviation, and we get a relatively low negative t stat of minus 0.32. And now to convert it into a p-value, we need to apply the two-tailed t distribution function, input the absolute value of the t stat as our x value, and input the adjusted number of observations as the degrees of freedom. So we have 46 plus 1212 minus 2. Closing the bracket, pressing enter, and we get 75.26%, which means that the probability that the returns on 
holidays are lower than the returns on all other trading days is different is below 25 percent it means that we can reasonably assume that there is no holiday effect indeed on the u.s market in the past five years it means that the anomaly has effectively disappeared another way of testing for the existence of holiday effect would be to use a simple linear regression we can just regress the s p 500 return onto the holiday dummy and we would basically estimate the difference between the returns on holidays and all other days and we could have tested for significance using the regression framework we could have just tested whether the coefficient of the regression is significant and that would have been much faster and easier so let me show you how to do that we need to select a two by five array as we've got one uh, explanatory variable the holiday dummy and the constant apply the linest function select the s p 500 returns as our y's as our dependent variable and select the holiday dummy as our x as our independent variable input one as we want the constant to be reported and in input one as we want the additional statistics reported and then we can press shift control enter and get the regression output note that those uh, two numbers the estimator of the coefficient on the dummy variable and the standard error if we convert them into percentages would be exactly the same as the ones we have obtained from the equal variance t-test now we can indeed just apply the t-test as we all know using the regression framework so divide the coefficient by the respective standard error and we get exactly the same t-stat and uh, testing for its significance we again use the two-tailed t-distribution the absolute value of the t-stat and the number of the degrees of freedom reported in the additional statistics and again we get an exactly equivalent p-value as our t-stat and our number of the degrees of freedom is equivalent so it means that if you have um, a choice what to do to test a particular hypothesis using a regression with dummy variables or to use an equal variance t-test the results would be always equivalent so what have we learned from today's tutorial so first there are two powerful tests one can use to determine whether there are differences in means you could just regress on dummy variables that signify some categorical variable or use an equal variance t-test provided that your um, equality of variance uh, f stat is reasonably low and returns a reasonably high p-value uh, or you could use a regression second with respect to uh, calendar anomalies and the holiday in fact in particular we have figured out that the results of Ariel that he obtained for 1970s and 1980s do not hold on the modern days US market and that's all there is for the holiday effect in the next videos in this series we would investigate other calendar anomalies and if this video reaches enough likes we would also delve into fundamental anomalies as well so please leave a like under this video if you found it helpful in the comments below i am eager to see any further suggestions on future videos on business economics or finance you would like me to make and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click this notification button thank you very much and stay tuned